hello everyone. I, um, it's kind of funny because if you think about what I'm going to be talking today, it's mostly related to stress relief and being stressed, anxious about different things. And I was so stressed that I actually forgot my water bottle coming up to the stage and all these other different things that make me realize that there's so many parts of our lives that we kind of just go through and as soon as we get through something, we get through a big test or we get over something that we were really nervous about, there's this huge moment in which there's this huge relief. So obviously, you know, even leading up to this, I was so excited to come and talk to people, some people that I know, some people that weren't here when I was a student here. And I think to myself, I really wanted to come and stand on the carpet, but I was planning on standing at the podium because I have all these notes, um, but I hope you guys don't mind. And I just want to tell you a little about one of my hobbies. So I talked about being interested in the neuroscience of sleep. And the reason that I didn't want to prepare any slides for today is because I think one of the most important aspects of sleep and important aspects of dreams is that there's this component of creativity. And when you're in your own mind and you're trying to be imaginative, I'd like you guys to join me. And in some of the things that I'll tell you, I might tell you to close your eyes and think about a certain situation. Uh, because a lot of times the thing that I like doing, which is lucid dreaming, as you can see from my title, um, it's kind of something that you need to be creative about, and I'm going to teach you guys how to become lucid dreamers yourselves. So I hope you guys enjoy, and if you guys have any questions, I'll say my email at the end, and you can email me. And I'd love to stay in touch, especially with um, some people that are here at BCA, because, I mean, I don't know, the school is changing so much, these blue lights are really cool in the auditorium, uh, but I still feel like I have such a strong connection with all of you, and I love coming back and talking to everyone. So, uh, to start off, there's a huge industry that's growing today with stress relief. Obviously, you've seen the advertisements for whether it's yoga classes or stress relief candles. There's all sorts of things that are going on. But one of the biggest things is meditation. And so meditation is kind of has a pro proposed connection to being able to benefit specifically Western society because there's this obsession in Western society with individualism and trying to be a leader on your own and not really necessarily working as part of a team. And this is different in other cultures where I remember once I actually visited Japan with Bergen Academies and we watched them set up an auditorium in minutes, all these chairs in perfect rows because everyone was working to blend together and work as a team. And so there's this aspect of when you're here and everyone is told to like do your own individual best, be your best person, and there's kind of this competitive aspect of competing against everyone else, there's this weird feeling of kind of being alone in that sometimes. And so meditation is specifically a time or a practice in which you can kind of sit alone. There's lots of versions of it. So you could just be sitting, uh, breathing, and breathing in and out slowly. You can have guided meditations. You guys have probably heard of Headspace as an app. Um, you can have a membership. A lot of people at school do it. It's uh, pretty cool, actually. I've never done it, mostly because last semester I was privileged enough to take a class on mindfulness meditation, and we had guided meditations once a week. Um, and so I actually found through this class that there's this really weird connection between mindfulness meditation and something that I have been doing my entire life, which is lucid dreaming. So. Um, the definition of mindfulness is really debated in the scientific community. It's kind of like one of those things where you know what something is, but no one really knows how to categorize it. Uh, this happens a lot in science because, specifically in psychology, uh, if any of you guys are taking AB Psychology, I remember there were so many definitions where I was always kind of like, wouldn't it just be easier if we talked about this in a practical, experiential term? But instead, there needs to be this scientific definition that's given to it, the way that it is framed. And so, interestingly, um, there's a scholar called, um, named Scott Bishop, and he was the lead author on a paper that had this opera operational definition for mindfulness, and he said that it was composed of two components, which was one, self-regulation of attention. And so, like I'm saying, there's these words, they're kind of inaccessible when you think about it, because when you hear me say self-regulation of attention, you don't think of what it actually is, which is being aware of your surroundings and being aware that you are aware which is the main thing. And so the second component is orientation to experience. And so when you are practicing mindfulness, one of the biggest components is actually you need to be open to being curious. 
And this is really important because there's kind of this uh, idea that it has something to do with being non-biased in terms of interpreting your surroundings. And you know, if you hear things that you're used to hearing, usually you would just not notice them. But when you're practicing mindfulness, you're supposed to take that into account and say, this is a stimulus that I get and I'm going to recognize that it's there and th kind of not think about it, but focus on it. And that's supposed to allow you to just become one with yourself and kind of get away from the stresses that are constantly going through your head. It's kind of called the wandering mind, which is definitely a thing I found out. I thought that, oh, mind wandering isn't that relevant. And my professor sent out a survey where randomly each day for a week, we would get an email and we had to click on it and immediately say, whether when we received the email, were we thinking about what we were doing or were we thinking about something else? And this is really relevant because I think that when I was younger, I was constantly thinking about what I was doing. But as I grew older, there's things that I need to focus on in the future. I'm trying to think, what am I gonna talk about in the next portion of this talk, things like that. But when you're actually in the moment, uh, you can kind of get a lot more from certain experiences. The whole stereotypical live in the moment thing is kind of a way to phrase it, but more differently, you can think of it as not allowing yourself to get stressed out and anxious about these upcoming things. And obviously that's hard because I myself am not very good at living by that rule, but I found that mindfulness really did help me. Uh, when we did practices every week and I tried to do it every day, I found myself kind of becoming uh, surprisingly less scared of sleeping before my homework was done. And this was because I would, you know, I would try to work around my schedule and put myself first. Um, I obviously understand that this is hard. And I remember being at BCA and staying up late and doing homework. And um, it's the same way now. I just say that now having this concept of trying to live in the moment um, and trying to not focus too much on what's making me anxious in the future, even though this will happen in the most stressful situations. I think it's really good to see, wow, you know, I can go to bed now. And when you tell yourself you can go to bed, like, it's very nice. Because I personally, like I said, my hobby is sleep. So I enjoy sleeping quite a lot. So I love to tell myself it's okay to go to bed and just wake up early in the morning and do my homework then doesn't work for everyone and I often do sleep through my alarm and so it doesn't always work for me either. Um, but this was a new perspective that I brought after practicing mindfulness. Uh, so um, it's important to mention the origins of mindfulness and some debates that are also happening about that. Uh, mindfulness comes from Buddhist tradition and so it was uh, founded in Southeast Asia. It's really important to keep in mind that mindfulness was kind of taken by many Western companies and just plucked away from an entire spiritual convention. Uh, there's many things in Buddhism about morality, and uh, you probably have learned about the Eightfold Path and all these things that you need to follow alongside mindfulness practice in order to attain um, basically moral righteousness and escape the cycle of reincarnation. And so many people have debated that you should not take mindfulness, the practice, away from its roots, which is things like being a good person basically simplified. I could talk about this all day, and we talked about it a lot in my class, um, but when we were talking about these things in class, I realized that my own version of this and kind of my way of like spiritualizing this being in the moment type experience was, for me, lucid dreaming. And this is weird because many people say, well, I've heard of lucid dreaming, that's when you're aware in your sleep. Uh, and it is. And weirdly, when I was a kid, I did not think that you were not aware that you were in a dream. So my friends would say, oh, I had a nightmare. And I'd be like, why not? Just tell yourself to wake up. And they were like, you're weird. You should know that you're asleep and you shouldn't be aware of the fact that you're dreaming. And so I don't really know why this was the case with me. I was kind of creative and loved to just like make up stories. So maybe that had something to do with it. Um, I do want to research it, which is why I'm interested in neuroscience of sleep. But I found that as I've grown older and stresses and anxieties have been added to my life, I no longer lucid dream just naturally. Um, and so I realized this and when I was in BCA, I decided that I wanted to figure out how to start doing it again on my own. And the reason for this and the reason I relate it and I've been talking about mindfulness for so long is because mindfulness 
specifically the practice of it, if we're talking about the operation, you can do, like I mentioned, these guided meditations, which sometimes there's things called the body scan, which is when you think about all the different parts of your body and you kind of bring them um, to a relaxed state by focusing on them. And then there's also um, compassion meditation, which you send love and you send happy thoughts to people, you know, people that you don't know, people that you love, and people that you might have problems with, which is another great version. But if you're not guided, the most common form of mindfulness meditation practice is actually just called um, mindfulness of the breath. And so mindfulness of the breath is when you do a controlled breathing in and out. It's kind of like if you really stress out, someone tells you to just breathe. Um, you're supposed to focus on one thing, whether that be like the actual motion of breathing, and you're supposed to be open to any things, sounds, noises, or things that you see if you're looking out a window while you're doing this. Some people close their eyes, but you can also do this while walking. Uh, we did it when we were walking through a park, and I realized that when you're doing this form of meditation, it's this focus on breath, and when you're asleep, you have constant breath. It's the same connection. There's this connection that's actually really important. You have this constant breath, and that is why I realized that when I was lucid dreaming, I was getting the same feeling that I got through mindfulness meditation. And it actually became a really great stress reliever for me when I figured out how to do it. So, um, just some examples of studies that have been done on lucid dreaming and dreams in general. So, um, Dr. Martin Chun, who is the Dean of Yale, he actually published a study where he was able to recreate the faces of people's dreams just uh, because of using an MRI. And that was incredible. I mean, it was a functional MRI, so um, it took a lot of work. But the fact that we are able to somehow connect thoughts to creating images that people are thinking about, this is the imagination aspect that I'm talking about. We can create images with our minds once we have the technology to do it, and we're getting there. Um, another thing that's interesting is that um, lucid dreamers um, have been involved in a study where they do a functional MRI, and they basically are able to signal by moving their eyes around when they're asleep, and that means that they are lucid and they're aware that they're dreaming. And then when that happens, um, they then are told to hold their breath while they're lucid dreaming. and. Uh, the study found that when people did this, they actually held their breath. So that means that you do have somewhat control over your body. You don't have control over your emotions when you're lucid dreaming. Obviously, that would be very dangerous if you were constantly sleepwalking. Um, but you do have this control over the breath. Nonetheless, it usually stays constant, which is why I find it to be similar to mindfulness practice. So another study is that um, the part of your brain used to read is not active when you're dreaming. And so people would say, oh, why can't you read things in your dreams? And uh, this was really interesting to me because I thought that I could read things in my dreams. And I've actually found in my own experience that through practicing lucid dreaming, I have found whenever I'm encountered with something to read, I then become lucid because I'll just be dreaming and not be aware that I'm dreaming. And then I'll suddenly be like, hey, I can't read this. And then I'll be like, oh, I'm in a dream. And then I can read it because that activates the part of your brain that's able to read. So I always thought that, that was really awesome. So my own experiences, I kind of used that as a way to kind of like figure out that I was dreaming in the middle of a dream. Um, but usually what happens for me is I'm able to start lucid dreaming after I wake up suddenly or I'm in a room with lots of light when I fall asleep, if I'm napping during the day. Usually if you were like doing a lot of activity, like doing your homework right before going to sleep, that's usually the best kind of thing to induce lucid dreaming. And so um, you guys have probably heard of this phenomenon called sleep paralysis. And that's when, when you wake up, uh, there's actually uh, two neurotransmitters in your brain. It's uh, GABA and glycine, if anyone here is taking AP Psych, because I remember learning about them. Um, they're actually really interesting in that they cause you to be paralyzed um, because you can't act out your dreams or else you'd be sleepwalking all the time. And so when this occurs, this sleep paralysis is really interesting because it uh, makes it so that sometimes when people wake up, they can see their surroundings, but they might start having hallucinations and they can't move. And this is really scary for a lot of people. Um, but what has happened to me personally is the exact opposite. So I once was 
<clears throat> awoken by someone walking into my suite when I had just fallen asleep on the couch last year, and I, someone was hugging me in a dream, and I opened my eyes, and I could still feel as if I was moving in the dream, and I could still feel someone hugging me, but I was aware of the fact that like I, my eyes were open, and I couldn't move, but it was so cool because I closed my eyes and I was back in the dream. So I found this just incredible. This is something that I think should be studied. And I think it's something that's also cool because a lot of people want to lose a dream because the coolest part of it is you can control your dreams once you get good enough at it. So you can kind of just like make your own imaginative realities when you're asleep. Um, so that was one of my own experiences. Um, when I first started trying to lose a dream, interestingly, I had a bit of a problem. That being that um, I was able to figure out that I was dreaming but I was not able to control it. And so one time I was in a room, I figured out I was dreaming, I said, okay, so I'm gonna start trying to control my dreams. And I said, I want a hot tub in the middle of the room. And the hot tub appeared, but it didn't have water. I was like, why on earth is my brain so mean to me? It's my own conscious kind of stopping me from fulfilling this goal I have of creating this really cool experience in my own head. And so that's another thing that I think needs to be studied. And all of these things really are not studied. It's kind of a new territory in neuroscience. There's limited studies on lucid dreaming. Um, really, when I did a paper on it last year, it was really only about that uh, breathing example I gave. So with these last two minutes, I'm gonna tell you guys how you guys can start to lucid dream. So if you draw on your hand anywhere, um, you could just put a dot on your hand. This is the first step, I call it, um, checking is everything normal. And so the way that this works is whenever you see that dot on your hand, you just look down at your fingers and you say, do my hands look normal? Do I have 10 fingers? Just quickly count off. Um, I did this for weeks and it wasn't working and I thought it didn't work. And then I stopped doing it and about a week after I stopped, I was in a dream. I looked down at my hands, went to count if I had 10 fingers and my hands were like this big. So the thing is, whenever you check something and you try to be aware of your surroundings as you would in mindfulness, um, in a dream, uh, it's not normal. So it's almost as if your brain wants you to become aware. I started to relate this to mindfulness because it's an awareness of being aware, right? Uh, so you kind of already are aware in your dreams, you just have to pay attention to it. And this is what I find really interesting. So step two, after you're doing that for a while, I'd say make a dream journal. So immediately when you wake up, the chemicals that are in your brain during sleep, they're trying to prevent you from forming memories. So you need to immediately write down dreams that you remember, and then you'll start to become better at remembering them and you'll become more lucid. Um, that's something I find really interesting. It's kind of hard to do, especially if you're usually waking up in a rush to get to class, but I've had a lot of fun doing it nonetheless. And then finally, find what works for you. For me, what works is reading things, like I said. Um, it works out really nicely. And then I figure out, oh, I'm asleep, and then I start to lucid dream. So there's some pretty cool benefits. With lucid dreaming, you can return to dreams after you've already woken up. You'll be able to not wake up if you hear noises and incorporate noises into your dreams. And then you'll feel more well-rested, I find. And you can also experience mindfulness while also getting some sleep. So remember, guys, you're already aware. You just haven't realized it yet. Thank you.